Hi, this is Steve. This is Bob. This is Jay. We are Alpha Quadrant 6, a science fiction review show. And on this episode, we're going to talk about our favorite aliens. What makes a good alien? What makes a good science fiction alien, Bob? What do you well, think? Maybe we'll start with one of your picks. It, well, I, I think the first thing I thought was, was that our topic was ambiguous. Alien, best aliens, what, what kind of alien? There's so many different kinds. So I think we need to describe them or frame it in terms of a character who may look totally human, but the character is alien and wonderful. So that's the best alien character. Right, and then there's pure design. Pure design where they don't really do or say anything, but the look and design and aesthetic is gorgeous. Or we could say the best alien species. Right, mm -hmm. and then you have both. If you, if, if you, that's a sweet spot, I think. If you're a great character and a great design, to me, that those are some of the best, the best aliens. But of you, course, you could have anyone from any category. So let's mm -hmm. let's frame it around that. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll start with mine. My, yeah, sure, like I'll go, go to number one: character and design. This is Jakar from Babylon Five. Yeah. The design, it's, it's a beautiful design. It's humanoid. All right, two legs, two arms, and a head, and eyes, and stuff. But the design and the paint job was gorgeous. The clothing, his clothing, his costuming was fantastic. Like, roy like royalty. Mm -hmm. And the character, I mean, how much can we say about Jakar? And Jakar, of course, was played by Andres Katsoulis. Yeah, great um, actor. He, now, oh, all right, fantastic actor, amazing actor, of course. But imagine his arc. He's got an arc that I think well, I would put against almost any other genre, genre actor out there. I mean, remember the first few episodes? Mm -hmm. He was a punk. Yeah. He was like, he was a bastard, you know? You really, yeah, he starts off as a villain and ends up as, a, as an ally. And his yeah. arc is beautiful. And I loved him in every, you know, Iteration that he came in, you know, like he when he was bad, when he was the bad guy, I, I like I loved hating loved him. Loved to hate him. And then when he becomes really like one of the best mm -hmm. good, good guys, guys on the show, he adored him to death. Yeah, was... he 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 really, you know, the actor did such a superb job that he made the makeup come alive. The makeup was actually his particular makeup out of everything else on that show was, I think, one of the best was, elements of the show. It was fantastic. And remember though, it's some there were some scenes where he was like full body. Prosthetics. I yeah. mean, he had mm -hmm. latex everywhere. That can you imagine eight to ten hours of full body latex? But most of the time, it was just pretty mm -hmm. much head and, and hands, maybe. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'll grant you. Alien. I'll, I'll grant alien. you. He's a great character. Right. Um, as aliens go, you know, he, he's fine. But as you say, he's very humanoid. Yes. Not very alien. That's a, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, also, you know, the the. Uh, that species of alien, very monoculture. Narn, yeah. Yeah, the Narn, Narn yep. which I don't like. You know, why did the Narn have one religion and sort of one government and one? We've talked you know, about culture. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah mo totally most monoculture. Most aliens have that that thing that. Yeah. What, what, what do you call that? Just like oh, a monoculture. Monoculture. They wear the same outfits. They have the. You know, it's all the same. Yeah, and um, intellectually, emotionally, intelligence-wise, very human level. It was basically right. a human that looked different. You know. So, yes, but not, that, again, but like Steve, the character, but as an alien, it was very TV alien. Yeah, right, know? but most aliens, like the vast majority of aliens that we've got to enjoy in the realm of science fiction for the last 50, 60 years fall actually into that category. I know, but that's largely, you know, I think practical and due to a lack of imagination. Absolutely, so absolutely. Let me go. Gene let, Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry was one, one, in the 60s, it was like, we got to make these aliens relatable. You need like two eyes, you need something, to a face to focus on. So a lot of times they just had like a brow ridge or a nose ridge exactly. or whatever, and they had to do that, and that but that was practical. The money, the expense, you could, they couldn't have elaborate special effects back then, not that elaborate, no CG back then. So, so yeah, and Jay, you're right, we have so many great aliens out there, and most of them are very humanoid. Mm -hmm. So there's not many that are, that are wildly divergent. But yes, I will grant you, Jakar is mostly on the character end of the spectrum, yeah. uh, with a little bit of the, he wasn't like Spock, who's pretty much a human with pointy ears yeah. and a weird tint to his skin and the eyebrows. He's much more alien than Spock. Yeah, but his heart was right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that, but so you, yeah. Because you brought up Spock, let's just click over to Spock. Okay. Um, because, yeah, Spock is half human, um, you know, the, the Vulcan side of him was, for lack of a better word, was fascinating to, to mm -hmm. the audience. Like, we love exploring his Vulcan side and, and constantly, unconsciously comparing him to what a normal human would do. And mm -hmm. that's part of the fun of the character. Um, but Leonard Nimoy did such a brilliant job of bringing that character to life. I mean, you can see the evolution of the character when you look at the pilot. Sure. You know, Spock yeah. was quite different back then. Um, he hadn't quite dialed it in yet. Yeah, but then he finally hits his stride. You know that his skin was going to be more green tinted, and they, they, they lightened it up because it, it didn't look right, I guess. It didn't like the way that it, it came yeah. out. But bottom line is, you know, Spock is, of all the aliens that exist, I think he's the most iconic and the most 
um, loved and related, mm. relatable. He's, he's, he's definitely, he's short definitely needs a, a mention. And I think, you know, as an alien, what's, what works, again, it's a low-tech human with a couple of prosthetics, but what works is the, the deep history that evolved mm -hmm. about the Vulcans. Absolutely, you know, The Vulcan yeah. as a, Vulcans as a race is iconic as well because uh, they have this particular you know, uh, outlook, you know, they're obviously dedicated to logic and reason. Infinite diversity and, and infinite Yeah, and, and, they, and there's, it's a great idea that really got fleshed out in the Star Trek universe. Um, and, you know, there's that history of them with the sort of split with the Romulans. Mm -hmm. And they, sure. they had to embrace logic in order to contain their warlike emotional selves. Right. And that brings up an entire dimension to that species, which is just great for storytelling. So Vulcans totally work as an alien species, as a device for science fiction. Yeah. Even though they're, and again, they retcon the whole why they look so human and why can you have a half human, half Vulcan? Because apparently we're all related in the Star Trek universe. Um, but yeah, you know, and I'm right. fi I'm fine with that. Like, one, if, yeah, one, as long as you throw that out there, so that there's a reason for it. But well, it, again, one of the sci-fi universe has got to do that, right? Yeah. And it, it 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 turns out it's Star Trek. They did it first. They did it they first. Did we yeah, want yeah, we, want, <laughs> we want the DNA connection. Um, I I also think that Vulcans are they're a great metaphor for humanity. Yeah. Right, you know, without going into the super details about it, but you know, we are comparing Spock to the other people on the bridge, and we're, we're particularly aware of his lack of quote mm -hmm. of lack of emotion. He's not. He doesn't have a lack of emotion. He has a he has an abundance of control. Don't you think you better check with me first, Captain? <laughs> Jim. Yes. Right. It's very That's different. Very different. Yeah. Um, which I I just love. I love that he's always got something. You know, I wonder if Leonard Nimoy was thinking, I'm going to just play a cool cucumber all the time, or if he was actually thinking in his mind, Spock right now is holding back this emotion. Yeah. That would that'd be a cool thing to, to right. find out right, if he right, ever right. was doing that. All right, I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum in yeah. terms of focusing on the alien species and not so much any individual character. Yep. Okay. And I'm also going to go to books. Because, yes. Or, because books are not limited by budget and special yeah. effects. You, yeah. can, you can write anything. But um, they're, they're limited by pictures, though. So well, you, I like picture books. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, the the uh, theater of the mind, Bob. Right, yes. it's all in your head. All right, so one of my favorite hard science fiction series, David Brin's Uplift Wars. Oh yeah, you okay, realize. fantastic. If, you, if you're into science fiction, you haven't read the Uplift Wars. Still a classic from basically the eighties. Um, and in in one, so the the, the five the galaxies are. Populated by a, a, an ancient, you know, multi-galaxy civilization, and every species in this civilization has been uplifted by a previous species. So you have a patron species and the client species. And uplifted, right. they were uplifted, meaning they were, you took a non-intelligent species and, and made, made them, them intelligent, sentient, sapient, you know, yeah, there's technological. One, there's one known species in the five uni five galaxies that were were not known to be uplifted. That they seem to have uplifted themselves through evolution. Mm -hmm. You know who they were? Who? Humans. Us. Oh. So humans get discovered, and we're considered a wolfling species. They assumed that we were abandoned by our patrons, not that we evolved on our own. Because who could imagine right. such a thing? Yeah. And by the time in that in our in human history, we had already uplifted dolphins and chimpanzees. So we were. So we were patrons. Yeah. Right. Because by their laws. Uh, of course, we were lucky we did that. Otherwise, we would have been this oh, yeah. weird. But it, well, well, it, it, it's it's complicated. You know, it's complicated, and it causes lots of problems as well. Because then we get immediately are in the game with so, species want to wipe us out. What's the alien that you? So well, there's lots. There's tons of great aliens. David Brin was was great at um, imagining aliens. So I'm going to focus on one that really exemplifies what I'm talking about: the Jofer. So this is an alien species that is essentially a series of five wax rings, right? You know like those towers of rings? Yeah. So you, that's basically, imagine that, but... But how's it get around? Who the hell would want to be one of those? Well, the, yeah, you, but you're thinking like a human, right? Okay. So Stop it, Jay. <laughs> each ring, each of the five rings is actually an individual organism, yeah. and they're kind of like just sort of loosely associated. They can communicate with each other through... Um, chemical communication, so there's no auditory communication, no visual communication, it's purely chemical. They exchange lipid proteins, so like lipid, if lipids So like if you're mad other. at the ring below you, you just excrete acid. You excrete, well, it's all, it was all waxy sort of molecules, but yeah. Are they in like a water and there, and container? There's, and, there's, and there's electrical communication. Well, no, they're solid. solid. How do they move around? They ooze around. What do they eat? 
I don't know. How do they have sex? That's a really interesting question. Oh, so, I know. They have sex when the... Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a the thing, thing that they're putting... <laughs> so, actually, when they were uplifted, they... Because yeah. they, they, the thing is, the, the different rings would sort of not get along with each other, so yeah. they really couldn't function in a really efficient, unified way. So, yeah. the uplifting of them, they were the trachea. They got uplifted to the Jofer by creating a master ring that had a strong sense of one identity. One ring to rule them all. One yes. ring to rule them yes. all. <laughs> and that's by a nanosecond. It brought the, uh, the, the collection of five rings together into one more coherent that, individual. That is probably one of the most unique yeah, aliens right? I've ever heard. Yeah. And so they, like, you, you know, you, we, but the thing is, Bryn made it work. Like, you read a book with one of these character, one of these species as a main character, and they're like completely not human. Yeah. And yet it totally works as a character, but it forces you to, to you know, challenge your concept of what an intelligent being is even. Mm -hmm. And I like when, when authors think of a way to make aliens different that I haven't even thought of. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're different in this way you didn't even think a species could be different in. Right, right, yeah. right. You know, it expands the, the scope of it. Because you're a human show. So one thing yeah, you got to make sure chauvinist. is when you're around one of those, you don't eat donuts in front of them. Yeah. Ever, right? <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> well, give me another one. Uh, we're talking about aliens. One of my favorites, top 10, it's got to be the Borg on, yeah. from Star Trek. These are it's like cybernetic organisms. They're mostly humanoid, unfortunately. You would, it would have been nice if they, if they weren't so uh, human-centric or, or mm -hmm. you know, bipedal, biped-centric. Um, every actor seemed to be a human, but they, as an enemy, they are they were fantastic. Um, I think they were arguably the best, you know, protagonists on Star Adversary, Trek. Yeah. Adversary, uh, their, their ship was like a like a, a mile and a half long. It was a gargantuan ship, bigger than any than Federation vessel or, or most of them. It was a it was a cube. Yeah. The ship was who has a ship as a cube in space, but it makes perfect sense because there's no aerodynamics, so so what? They were powerful, and of course I love I love technology and robotics and things, so they were completely cybernetic and had robot parts, cybernetic parts everywhere. They're definitely they were, they were my just, favorite collective. And yes, they were, they, it was a collective intelligence, it was not, no, there was not one adversary, unless you bring in the queen, that's a different argument, but you <laughs> couldn't reason with it, it was like the Terminator, you, you can't reason with it, there's nothing, they were going to do what they were going to do, and they were just like collecting technology and information throughout space, and they were quite formidable. So they were a fanta just a fantastic um, adversary for, in the Star Trek universe, yeah. and I just always loved them. What a foil, I know, I totally yeah. agree. Mm -hmm. and, it, and the episodes that became Came very special to me was whenever like that Borg shield would come down where like you actually get to know one of the Borgs a little bit right mm -hmm. like it happened from time to time you know like you get a yeah, little like bit yeah like the bit of the, the person they were before they were assimilated right. yeah you know it's seven, seven of nine you get a lot of that in the Voyager series also um, it, the Borg were also in many of the series I know they were in next gen they were in uh, they were in Voyager as well, mm -hmm. and and Voyager was not my, one of my favorite Trek series, but they had lots of Borg episodes, and they were almost invariably excellent, yeah. really interesting. Uh, you could argue that some of the best episodes across the series were some, were some of the Borg ones. They were great. So on my list is a similar species, uh, but with some interesting differences. Now this is another novel because again I like aliens in, no. in novel series. This is the Gap series, Stephen Earl Donaldson. Mm -hmm. You guys familiar yeah, with that? I know Donaldson, really? but not the Gap series. Yeah, again. Fantastic hard science fiction, really? Bob. Yeah, very, very Ooh, good. I put that on my list. Um, yeah, t totally worth it. So uh, this is the Amnion, right? The Amnion are like their Borg. Uh, this is now in this, you know, future universe. The the humans have not encountered any other aliens before. So this is our first contact with the first alien species, and the Amnion are described as a, a humanoid sea anemone. A sea enemy? Yeah. <laughs> With fronds like these, who needs an enemy? Um, I, can't, I cannot say what that. What the word. hell? Where'd you get that from? <laughs> from Finding Nemo. Hello. Oh, yeah. it's been a while. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, uh, they, so they're like roughly human, but they have like multiple eyes and tentacles yeah. and hands and everything like that. Um, so while here, I, I mentioned that I like species that vary in a way that you didn't really think of varying. Yeah. So one of the things that was different about them is the, um, the, the, the degree of variability from individual to individual is 
massive. Oh, great. So from one individual to another, they could have different number of eyes, a different number of arms, a different configuration of arms. So, you know what I mean? Like there, there's like almost like a theme, but not a specific morphology. You yep. could recognize them as an amion, but there's a tremendous amount of variability, which is interesting. But what I like about the amnion is, again, that they are alien. They're, they're, that's not the only degree to which they're alien. They're, they're aliens in their emotions and their psychology. They're like so alien to humans that the big challenge that drives a lot of the plot in the series is we don't even know how to communicate with them. We, like we're struggling to find common ground with these aliens because they're like psychologically, they're intelligent, they're technological, but we can't even find common ground with them to communicate. Well, um, Sure, but you know the thing is, it's like okay, but that doesn't really get, it only get you so far. How do you say I want a donut in math? Man? It's tough. <laughs> or just just understanding their motivation. We cannot understand which their is motivation. which is realistic, right? Which, that's of course. realistic. Of course, we'd have no but, clue. Like, but how it, do you talk to a flower? It'd be like, yeah. Eh, you know. So it turns out that they are hive-like, right? So they're very Borg-like in that they're a hive, but they're they're not, and they are trying to assimilate humans. Assimilate. Yeah. Wow. But not through technology like the Borg, but through mutagens. So just by so their technology is biology, so all Ooh. of their tech is biology wow, based, that's fine. and so they're trying to assimilate us by basically infecting us with their mutagens, uh -oh. which is similar to I know one thing one thing on your list, right? The thing. The thing, yeah. Well, yeah. Which we can which we can get to. Well, next. it's kind of like Borg. They do that injection of the nanites and yeah. convert you to a Borg dude. Yeah, so. although it's all it's, it, yeah. the manifestation is technological. So that that theme was reflected in like the recent movie Arrival, where Ted Chiang. Yeah, awesome we have dude. an alien species awesome who looks awesome. very alien, who communicates in a completely yep. different way, and the challenge was trying to even communicate with them to interface with them and they had such a different view of reality that of, it at time of, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they, yeah they were actually, of reality they weren't temporarily similar right? yeah. Right. yeah it was so different that it actually the reality was literally different than ours so yeah. i love that right um so that was just it was such a compelling alien you weren't even sure if they were an adversary they didn't like they weren't fighting against us or they didn't there wasn't a war it was just the amnions. The amnions, yeah. they're, right. they're, what they were just going about their business, it was just sort of inconvenient for us, you know what I mean? Like it was yeah. incompatible with our, us going about our business without yeah. really being in direct, it was more like a cold war than a direct conflict. Yeah. Well, what would this, what would the, how would the mutagens be introduced? Well, yeah, like if you go, go aboard their ship, you know, and then you breathe it in, and you breathe it in, you leave, right. and then suddenly you start mutating and turning wow. into one oh, of them. That's well, I would argue we're comparing the, the mutagen which is biological and the technology, but I would argue that a true Borg, their technology would be biological in, in, yeah. in complexity. Yeah. They didn't go there though. You know, no, they, it, it was it was a, an extrapolation of modern technology. It wasn't the mm -hmm. technology that I think you could see in centuries in the future, where it was, it's even more sublime, if you will, than even biology itself, more complex. Yeah. All right. So, so let's talk about the thing. Yeah, the thing really is is somewhat similar uh, to what yeah. you were saying. So while you were talking, I'm sitting here thinking, well, what's a thing's origin? We never heard about yeah, the thing. Yeah. That, was it created in an alien laboratory? Was it, did it evolve? You know, like it could, it could have. Was it flying that ship? Did it build that ship? It's civilization. What does it, it look it like? No, I think it took it? over. I think hijacked, it hijacked yeah. that ship. What's the base alien? I don't think it has right. a, a, a base look, but we, yeah. you know, someone has to write it. Someone has to, whoever owns the yes. thing, I guess. Do but, that. Somebody do that. So the idea with the thing, first off, the thing is, is uh, by far, one of the best science fiction, horror movies, monster movies of all time. We, we've already covered this. If you don't know, you can go see our review on that. I, and God, I yeah. loved it. I loved, I loved, Such I loved the thing so much, I loved editing the video <laughs> of us talking about the thing. So the thing can turn into basically any kind of biology by sampling the biology. Mm -hmm. um, and then it basically eats you. It's, right. It, just, you it know, converts your cells into its cells. Yeah, and it yeah. eats your biomass and uses you uh, to, to do what it does. Um, now there, there's a few things that are that I find particularly interesting about the thing is one that it stores the information of previous creatures it took over, mm -hmm. so it can use an alien arm, it can use a, the head of a dog, it could use you know limbs and whatever you know all sorts of different things that it's picked up from uh, from different species. And now there was a, a short story that someone wrote, Bob, that you and I both love called "The Things," right? Yes. Now, there was something in there that was really cool. They were talking about how it was using cold resistance by some other alien, um, mm. which, you know, you just extrapolate, like, right. what, if the thing has any kind of mind inside of it, it could intelligently pick 
you know, things that, oh, I need heat protection, I need cold protection, right. I need to not have to drink it's water. Sort of filing through its catalog of, of traits yeah. and right. picking the ones it needs for the moment. But there was a short adaptable. story, Jake, uh, called The Things, which was basically the movie, The Thing, John Carpenter's a thing, but in, from the point of view of the, the aliens. The aliens, yeah. So right, it's but, but wonderful. It's, it's and it was also the thing on the wing. <laughs> the thing on yeah. the wing. Right? Uh, that would be a funny cartoon for someone to draw. But okay. okay, so the idea though is we don't know if the thing is conscious or not. We really don't. It 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 mimics things. Yeah. But it also seems to act with, um, you know, it, it just reacts, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's it's really good at hiding itself. But then when it gets called out, so I, I always question... But when, but when like it's mimicking an individual organism, it has that organism's intelligence, even their memories. Yeah, sure. So Absolutely. It has to be. But, it, but still, somewhere in there, it, it knows it's the thing. And it is the thing. Yeah, I mean, there, there's speculation about that. You know, you so intelligence say, is maybe just one more adaptability that it uses. Like, oh, I need to be smart. Let me be something smart. Yeah, now. maybe. Yeah, yeah, I know. It could, be, it could tap into anything, yeah. I'm sure. Um, and the variability of it and the uniqueness of it, because it doesn't have a look. It doesn't have its own thing. It, it's, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, it really is to, up to it's, your imagination. It's infinite adaptability yeah. is its thing, yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it's scary as hell. Like, yeah. of, of aliens that we're supposed to be afraid of, it's the ultimate predator. It's the ultimate monster. Yeah. And you could be a thing right now. We wouldn't even know. I've, we've already talked about this. Yes. That's, well, that's also like if, if, there was, hot wire. if the Earth were going to be invaded by any alien species, that would be the worst. Yeah. It just because it takes us over in the background, you know, and you yeah. can't, how could you, once it's out in the wild, we're done. It's game over. There's really nothing we can do about that's it. That's right. And, and one more thing about it. Um, I, I think that the argument for the thing being kind of unconscious it's, it is because of this. Because the way that it could easily win is just never reveal itself. Like if the dog came into the thing, you know, to the compound, mm -hmm. if it never did the transformation, it, it just infected everyone, it would have yeah. won. So I think it... There's a little bit of instinct. Yeah, there's there. instinct happening. It, like the in, dogs were there. It's like, okay, point. I have to convert those. It wasn't the right move. Tactically, right. but they were there, and it just followed its instinct. It does what it does. But that the dog sensed sensed it, it to be different, and the dogs were reacting in a way that it didn't like, and it reacted to them. Like right. that's that's yeah. my point. Like it will react to the environment. Yeah, you know, it's not super smart. Like I, all I got to do is infect everyone. It doesn't operate that way. It's constantly trying to feed and. and take well, I over. think what the best thing about the thing is that it provoke so many questions. Right. We don't know. We don't know the answer to a lot of these questions, but just thinking about it, like, oh, well, how does that work? You know, just it, it, endless questions. That, and it, sometimes it's better not to answer them because then that leaves us the, the freedom to speculate. Exactly. Yep. You know, so much. It's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, sometimes Bob. answering it makes it lame. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, man, I realize the best you can do. I know. You have to yeah. be careful when you answer those kind of questions because you, chances are it's not as good as people's imaginations. All right, Bob. You All right, I'm going to throw this one out here. This is a, from Pure Design. This one will be a little bit different because it's not one alien. I'm talking six aliens. So I'm, I'm essentially talking about the first five minutes of the movie Valerian and uh, Thousand Planets or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I was watching this and it's a, visually some, stunning. Movie. Some of the some of the yes, visually was stunning. The reviews weren't that great, so my expectations weren't very high. So I'm watching watching the first five minutes and I was blown away. Unfortunately, the rest, the, the following <laughs> was, 170 was minutes, was, was, you know, wasn't. I mean, it was still beautifully, beautifully created. But you know, the writing and the acting, you know, some problems. Yeah. But the first five minutes, you have, you have, um, you have the uh, space station, the first space station in the 70s. But then, then it's an alternate reality because it starts. It doesn't end. It doesn't crash into the into the ocean eventually, which it which it did. But um, it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and becomes this gargantuan space station. Mm -hmm. so, you, so in the first five minutes, you're tracking it over the decades and even the centuries. And as people from other countries are coming on for the first time and they, they walk up to the, to the commander of the, of the space station and they shake his, and they shake his hand. And so all, so all major cultures are represented. It's a hub of, of human cooperation. It's a beautiful thing. And of course, the background music is... Um, Major Tom. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, come on, yeah, yeah. fantastic music put to a put put in a scene that I think is one of the best it's ever been. And that's a that's a statement. So, but then at some point, a couple hundred years in the future, this ship comes by, and the ship's the ship's beautiful, but it's an alien ship, and the first alien ever walks walks on. And then for the last two or three minutes of this intro, you have five other six aliens in total walking on the ship and walking to the the commander. And, and kind of shaking hands, and you and you can tell time is passing because the commander's getting older. The the, the suits, the suit designs change, yeah. but each alien that comes up, they are gorgeous. I don't know 
who did these these designs, but they just blew me away. And they, they some of them were suited like an ex, a metal exosuit, so you don't even see what's in it. Some of them were pure organic, just just an alien with skin and and uh, like many aliens you, you have seen. Some of them are cybernetic, uh, where there's, there seems to be some organic pieces, but also some, some robot pieces. Mm -hmm. and, and one of them was like, seemed purely robotic. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the designs were just, just blew me away. These, these were aliens that were so memorable. I saw this a couple years ago, I never forgot. I watched it again today. Just if you wanted to see, the, the movie was okay. Watch the first five minutes if you see nothing else. And I just love that that scene. And these, each alien was wonderfully made and designed and complex yeah. and just gorgeous. It so is I'm, amazing I'm gonna give a throw out just to that. There's yeah. six aliens from the first five minutes mm -hmm. of that movie. I'm gonna finish my novel trifecta, although this was a movie, with uh, Dune. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. one of my, again, one of my favorite. It was gonna happen. One of my favorite series. Uh, mm -hmm. Very hard to do it justice in, in film. Uh, I, I love the movie Dune, yep. but it never didn't really do justice to the novels. It was just a, it's almost like a cult right. classic. Right, like the for Lord me. of the Rings of, of science fiction. Yeah, right? in I mean, a way. Epic, um, sprawling. So the sandworms. I mean, again, iconic. Yeah. Uh, they're aliens, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. And they, they are they are you know magnificently large. They're magnificent creatures. They're like the dragons of that world. Mm. You know, they're just absolutely massive. But what I like about the the worms is their life cycle mm -hmm. is very different. And, and this, is a, this is a plot in, that runs through the novels. Again, I'm gonna give you a spoiler here if you haven't read the novels, but um, you guys, I don't know if you guys yeah, have read, yeah, read yeah, all course. the novels. So you know the sand trout. Of course. The, the, the sand trout in Dune, they essentially sequester the water and make the planet a desert. And they do that in order to create the space for the worms. And of course the sand trout are the worms, yeah. right? They, they develop into the worms. Um, so, and then of course, the, then the sandworms make the melange, which, which, which the spice, which runs the, rules the, runs the, the galaxy. galaxy. Yeah. Uh, so I love the fact that they're, you know, they're just such interesting creatures. They have a fascinating life cycle. The, the, uh, the way that they were made integral to that whole series of books, mm. you know, they really are like part of the, the plot, part of that. Sure, the, yeah, they're, they're a character without they're, a doubt. Yeah. Yeah, that, they're 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 a character. They're they're part of the setting. They're 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 critical and and mysterious at the same time. You know, they have some kind of connection. They have this connection with the Kwisatz Haderach and just the humans in general, mm -hmm. um, which you know again adds another layer. So, fantastic use of of an alien, a unique alien species in that novel. Yeah, in that series. It's cool to think that uh, when he came up with it. You know, like he, yeah. he was like, it, you know, because you could think it's a worm, it's a big worm, it's kind of silly or whatever, but it isn't. It, it's it's a very deep yeah. part of of his story, and it's not a simple creature. You know, right, it's, right. It's not and like, the teeth become made into the Chris knives yeah. and daggers yeah. for the, for the fremen. Mm. I mean, just it's integral to the culture. You know. All right, so I have to, of course, mention the xenomorph. From yeah, the movie the Alien. alien. The Queen Alien. alien. <laughs> this is, this is this, alien. and you'll see the pic a picture of one behind us. Now this is the you know the quintessential alien. It it is very alien, even though it's bipedal. It, the the reasoning of of that is because it, it takes some of the DNA from its mm -hmm. host. So a few things about the xenomorphs. One, um, right. their their life cycle is amazing. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. the face hugger, like the eggs get laid and the face hugger plants the seed. You know, it has to inject yeah. the seed in. They needs it needs a host in order to gestate. Mm -hmm. um, and the face hugger DNA. all by itself is an amazing alien. Creepy, right? It's super creepy. And then you know, it, it becomes like it becomes a xenomorph. The ones that we're used to seeing again are humanoid. They're they're very dangerous. They're brutal. They you know they're pretty hardy. Mm -hmm. They have acidic blood, which is scary. Molecular acid. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> crazy acid. Yeah, yeah. crazy acid. Um, and on top of that, like, they, when they add the numbers, when you see them come at force in numbers, it's horrifying. Like Even one. I mean, again, the first movie, the, the, the classic Alien, which is still a classic of science fiction, was one creature. Yeah. You know, we just followed the life cycle of one alien. And it was a, you know, a perfect sci-fi horror you know, yeah. monster. Um, the whole like the teeth inside the teeth and it shoots out. Yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah, and inspired. Just, yeah, and then it's it's uh, Geiger, right? Or yeah, H.R. Geiger. H.R. Geiger. Uh, you know, that's how I pronounce it. Probably the most gorgeous, artistically designed alien in science fiction. Without I mean, a doubt. just 
again, iconic, beautiful, beautiful work of art. And while it's beautiful and horrifying at the same time, which is That's always, rare. always yeah. fantastic, it's very, very powerful. Um, and of course, it spawned a whole franchise. Just the, just I think, really, just the, the beauty of that alien creature. Um, so I, I agree that this ha that has to be on the list. So before we go, I have to mention there's so many other ones that I want to talk about. Quick, quick, honorable mentions, and then I'll finish with the last. Zayfad Bibelbrox. Like Zayfad Oh my God, wonderful character. Chewbacca. Chewbacca. He's, he's an amazing alien. Mm -hmm. Like he just, I don't know. There's something special. Predator. Great. Come on, great alien. Without predator. a doubt, the Predator. Um, I love I love the old ones the Lovecraftian creatures. Yeah, you know, you know if you yeah you, I'm into it. I, I think they're so am I, but I don't consider them aliens. But you know that's fine. Right. Um, I mean, they are they are aren't they? I mean, it's it's a very interesting discussion that right. we don't have time to get right. into right now. But Invader I, Zim, Invader Zim, yeah, the Daleks, Vogons, Daleks, the Vogons, yeah. exterminate even to the Time Lords. Even time Lords, yes, human. Time Lords. They're, I like that they're. They have an interesting life cycle too. They just regenerate, and yeah. they Into sort of have their of yeah. They have their their memories, but their personality can be different. Their likes and dislikes can be different. Yeah. And now we know they could change gender. Ah, yeah, yes. it's very interesting. So I, before we go, I so have to I have to mention the Krell from Forbidden, Forbidden Planet. Planet. Yeah. The, Krell. the Krell. You never see them. Yeah. You never actually ever lay eyes on them. You never hear any of them. They're dead. They're gone. It's an extinct alien species. But they are is so. There, yeah. Is there any other? Sci-fi. I'm sure there is, but I can't think of one. Any other sci-fi story or genre where um, the and there's an alien species that are extinct that are yet is still like a major character in the. I don't know. I, I, I can't a major think character, of it. and uh, I mean Neil Asher, one of my favorite hard science science fiction. There's, yeah. a, there's there's a few ancient alien species that have essentially disappeared. Yeah. Um, and they're they you know they're mentioned quite often. Some of them aren't really disappeared. Um, but I won't give any spoilers. Okay, well, anyway, so the Krell. Yeah, so here are the reasons why I, I have to mention the Krell. One, because they left such an impression on me. And when you're hearing, you know, the characters in the movie talk about them, and, and you're hearing, you're seeing their technology, and you hear what happened to them. You hear their music. Yeah, and their music, they become a character, because the writing is so yes. freaking good. And I said this when we talked about them the last time in some other review that we did that I, I would love someone to try to bring them into reality, like to see what they looked like and to see their culture. I know it'd be very hard because, you know, it's, sometimes it's better not to go there. Yeah. Well, but, there, there, there's going to be a remake of Forbidden Planet. I, I did not yeah. know that. And I hope they don't show the Krell. I think the Krell work as a species that we never see. We have an archaeologist's view of the Krell. Yeah, I like and that. And they work, that's what they are. They are an archaeological alien species. Mm -hmm. if, it's like what we were saying before. Sometimes when you give the answer, to the mystery. It's a letdown. It's a letdown. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much better for us to imagine, oh, that's the shape of their door, and that's their technology, and that's their music, and we infer something about their intellect and their amazing, personality. Though, that's so much better than, here's, a, here's what I imagine them to be. No, screw I don't care what you imagine them to be. Yeah. Just leave that archaeological, you know, um, Imagination. That's all we need. They were intended to be a, a part of our imagination. Yeah. I think, and I think part of that plays into the story of Forbidden Planet very nicely because yeah. they used their imagination. The whole story is about imagination. That's right. You know, so I guess it really Monsters doesn't matter. from the end. Yeah, like they did, 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 and they did. became their. Oh God, it's such a good story. All right, it's a I great story. What you got? One more? I got it. Because now what? that I'm thinking about Neil Asher, I mean the Jane, the Jane and Neil Asher, Asher are. They were an ancient species that went extinct, and they're not. They, they're not extinct. They were, they created, oh man, where do I even start with these guys? Uh, there's not a lot of description of exactly, of exactly how they look, but what's left is these, their technology, and their technology is designed. You would have this little bit of Jane technology that could detect a technological civilization. And once it realizes that this is a technological civilization, it, it somebody, like some absorbs it or ingests it and becomes amazingly powerful. So for, for a period of time, he's able to manifest these technologies that are way beyond, mm -hmm. way beyond even even the, this, this, the technological setting of the of the series, centuries in the future. Amazingly powerful. But then what happens is it's self-limiting because it basically insists itself in the in the person, and he becomes all these little Jane nodes that then disperse for other civilizations oh, wow. to find, so that they can destroy themselves as well. And that we find out in in the later book. That, that spoilers that the Jane um, were they were fascinated because they never to them war and sex were the same thing. If they would they would encounter each other and they would fight and make love at the same time, basically ripping each other apart. Uh, where there's one winner and they would take the best of the of the defeated mm -hmm. opponent and and make it themselves because they're they're and, basically machines. 
Uh, at this point, it's beyond even even it's even hard that. To say. Hard hard to say, but no, they were they were definitely biological. That's an interesting life so, cycle. So yeah, that's an, that's a life, and that's, that's a why, death cycle. <laughs> and, but that's one of the reasons why. Oh, there's so many spoilers here. But that's one of the reasons why they didn't spread far and wide because they couldn't really travel away from each other because they needed people to rape and have war and go to war with so that they could absorb their their uniqueness and become oh. kind of. And you you're not quite the same once you right. have sex or go to war with each other. You're a, kind of a, a a little bit of a new creation, although you did win. Uh, fascinating aliens, and you, would you call that biological misappropriation? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's their life cycle. Who's yeah, the yeah. judge? Who's right. the judge? Yeah, I don't judge them. No judge. Them <laughs> so, all right, I have to throw out my honorable okay. mention. Okay, come on. The uh, Vorlons and the Shadows yes. from Babylon 5. Of course, yes. the Shadows oh, yeah, the are shadows. gorgeous. The Shadows are... It's good that you're pairing them together. They belong fantastic. together. Right, they're, 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 totally. They're, they're, they're yeah, two halves of the same them. coin. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, they're, they're angels and demons, right? Yeah, right. And the, the Shadows, though, like, when I saw them for the first time in Babylon 5, I was like, whoa, yes. that's a cool... That was the coolest yeah. alien I had seen up to that point. Just really incredible. Yeah, multi-limb, definitely quadro quadrupedal like yeah. but with yeah. extra limbs yeah, and, yeah. and black and pointy yeah. I just love though that ah. they brought at the end they brought it full circle and yes. you're like it, it was part of a plan it was for a reason it wasn't like pure evil stupid mustache yeah. twisting shades bad guys shades of grey shades of grey yeah. absolutely because you could get pissed off at the Vorlons too yeah. the yes. Vorlons were, they were basically they were the same they were, yeah. Uh, yeah you're right initially you're thinking Vorlons good shadows bad but in the end it's like no they're actually both the same yeah. they're just yeah. doing the same kind thing in, in different between. ways yeah. 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 Right. they're both different shades of grey yeah yeah, very interesting. If you haven't seen Babylon 5, you check know, it out. Binge it has, it has aged so, well. It has listen, aged well. We know. You, we didn't mention your favorite alien, and we're sorry. We're very sorry that we did. Hey, maybe this, we'll do a part two. Send us the aliens that you thought we left out. That's a great out. idea. Video game aliens, we didn't really touch yeah. that at all. A anime, you know, or, it, or animated, didn't it, really this touch. This was supposed to be a top ten list. We had to make a cut somewhere, but we, we couldn't even do it. We right. spilled into yeah. like 15, yeah, I think. Yeah. So if you like the show, please go to Alpha Quadrant and the number six dot com. You can look at our YouTube page. You can go to our Facebook page. And if you want to help support the show, you can become a patron of ours. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Alpha Quadrant six. See you next time. Thanks.